your hands together for the Lord on a Wednesday. Man, it's good to see you tonight. Can you believe we're already talking about Christmas? Y'all, does that freak you out? That is so crazy to me. Where's the year gone? Whew. I've, I heard this, I've heard this saying my entire life, and the older I get, the more real it becomes, but like the older you get, the faster time goes. I don't, I don't know what it is. For me, it may be the stage of life that I'm at, like I'm in when, when you have kids, you have something to measure time by, and you're like, I remember when you were like this big, and now you're a teenager. Like, how does it happen so fast? Like, how am I now have some gray hair? What is what is happening? Lord, right now we pray. It's a joke. That's a joke. We are we're gearing up for the end of the year. I'm telling you, it's gonna be a fantastic year. I do want to give a huge shout out to really I was I was standing over here during worship and I was just I became overwhelmed with gratitude for a particular uh, serve team. And that, that serve team that I was overwhelmed with gratitude for tonight was our prayer team. Come on, aren't you grateful? Aren't you grateful for a team that partners with you in prayer? They go to battle with you. They may not know you, but they care enough about you to go to war with the enemy over what's coming against your life. I'm grateful for men and women who will stand with the body of Christ, to every prayer team member that's here tonight, thank you. Thank you for pouring your heart out. And it, it's a beautiful thing to just, I know it's loud, I know worship's loud, I know they're screaming at you and you're screaming back at them, but you're making a difference. And I honor you tonight, I'm excited about the word of the Lord tonight. I'm, I'm so excited to be opening God's word. Anytime that I have the privilege of opening God's word, it is just, it just makes me happy. And it's always, you know, the more you, you public speak and you, you, you get in front of people, it's not, it's not the crowds that bother you. It's not the, the number of people, whether it was one, one person or 20,000 people, it's not really the number of people. When you preach God's word, what, what pastors feel every Wednesday and every Sunday is the hope and the prayer that they communicate the word of God the way that it's been laid on their heart. And that, that, is, that is the thing that I struggle with every time that I, that I step out here, and it's my prayer. Lord, let me communicate your word in such a manner that it falls on hearts that may not have even been receptive when they walked in. But when your word is spoken, Lord, let it begin to soften the ground of their hearts. And even in, even in hard soil, see, hard soil always has cracks. And let the word of the Lord fall in the cracks of those hearts and let it begin to do a work. And I believe the Lord's gonna do just that tonight. We, uh, we continue our journey through the book of 1 Samuel and before we get too deeply into chapter 21 this evening, let's, let's quickly make sure that we know where we are in the story. It's been a week or so, a couple weeks since we've been in 1 Samuel chapter, uh, or, or the book of 1 Samuel. And so chapter 20, you'll remember um, that, that David gets the evidence that he needs to know that King Saul is most definitely after his life. Like, there's no guessing now, and here's kind of how, how that played out, how the evidence came to be. Jonathan, Saul's son, who also is David's best friend, is on a mission to help David, and he's, he's going to help David by having this come to Jesus meeting with his dad, and so they begin to devise a plan on what this is going to look like, and here, here was the plan that they came up with. Jonathan tells David, he said, listen, you're to wait by the stone heap, and after this conversation that I have with my dad, I'll know what his true intentions are. I will know without a shadow of a doubt, and after the conversation, you wait by the stone heap, and I will come and I will relay what I found to you. 
And here's how I'm going to do that. I'm going to shoot arrows in your direction. And if the arrows land past the rock heap, then you will know. It will be a sign to you that my father is without question trying to take your life. And if I shoot arrows and they fall short of the rock heap, you will know that it's safe to return, that my father's intentions um, are, are not to take your life. And we know how the story in the chapter, uh, chapter 20 ended. We know that the arrows would go beyond the rock heap, signaling that but for sure David's life is now in danger. And there's no, there's no trying to you know, dance around it and, and maybe, no, maybe, he's, maybe he was just having a bad day. No, this is, this is now what you're facing, David. You are facing the king of all people. It's one thing when somebody's trying to kill you. It's a whole nother thing when the king is trying to take you out. If, if a person, in, trust me, I'm sure it's not good if just a regular old person in society is after you but chances are they may not have all of the means that maybe the king would have. The king has eyes everywhere. The king has people in his pocket. The king, you, it's hard to escape when the king is after you, and this is, this is what David is having to come to grips with, and it's almost, the, the way that I see it is almost David's life is flashing before his eyes, and he's having one of those moments that that you hear and you, you see on movies like when disaster strikes and, and alerts are going off. This is not a drill. This is not a drill. This is real life. Like this is actually happening. And this is, this is where David finds himself. This is what his life has come to at this point. It's this, this fight or flight moment. Do I, do I try to stay and fight the king or... Or do I run? I don't really know what my options are. He's scared for his life. And he realizes that he has no chance if he stays to fight. So for many numerous reasons, he chooses to run. David chooses to run. Watch, watch how this plays out. 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 1. David, David went to Nob. To Ahimelech, the priest. And Ahimelech trembled when he met him and he asked, Why are you alone? Why, David, is no one with you? And I think before we get too far into the message this evening, I think the first thing that jumps out at me in this chapter is the very first sentence of the first verse. David went to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. When David ran, where did David run to? When David ran, he ran to the house of the Lord. Why is it? When all hell breaks loose in our world, Why do we have a tendency to run in every other direction? We run away from the place that can actually sustain us, the place that can give us life. I'm, and, and I'm not trust, I'm not throwing stones. People have their own reasons. But I can't tell you how many times I have conversations with people who are hurting, who are broken, who, who are trying to figure life out. And their first response is to run away from the things of God. But David, when he ran, at least David knew where to run. David doesn't have it all together, as we're going to find out. David goes a little crazy in this chapter, but at least when he ran, he ran to the house of God. So where do we run? I'll tell you where we run. We, we run oftentimes to things of pleasure so that it will numb the pain. Now, some of this is going to hit hard, and some of this is kind of soft, but it's going to hit you anyways. We run to places of pleasure to numb the pain. Now, let's start soft, and then we'll get, we'll get a little bit more up. Bow. We run, we run to movies to numb the pain. We run to Netflix to, run, to, to numb the pain. We, we run to sleeping some of y'all run to shopping. 
Some of y'all run to Amazon. Some of us, and I put me, some of us run to, to food. Now let's change gears a little bit. When we're trying to numb the pain of what we're going through, some of us run to a bottle. Some of us run to a cigarette, a joint, prescription drugs, pornography, illicit and immoral sexual relationships, which by the way, this ain't in my notes, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it. The Bible, listen, the, the Bible is clear. I, I'm not throwing stones, but I need to make it plain. Sexual activity outside of marriage is a sin. Ah, uh, you get quiet on me now. <laughs> and, and some of us, listen, again, I'm not throwing stones, but we wonder why our relationships are in such chaos and such havoc, it's because you're not doing it the way that the Lord laid out for you. If you will trust the Lord's plan and you will walk in relationship the way that God has marriage planned out for, you're going to see your relationships have a much higher success rate. What do you run to to try to numb the pain? What, what is that thing of pleasure for you, and I just need to tell you that all of these are cheap substitutes for a close relationship with God. Every one of them are cheap substitutes, and on, on the surface, listen, I've, I've been there. I don't, I don't claim to be perfect. I have my, my share of issues just like anybody else in the room, but on the surface, things of pleasure seem like a quick fix for our troubles. And we know this, and I've preached it, but they're always short-lived every time. Things of the world bring pleasure for a moment, but it always leaves you hurting in the end. Things of the world are always short-lived, and as a result, we are left with an unspiritual hangover that leaves you feeling guilty, filled with regret, full of fear, the fear of being exposed leaves you feeling isolated. Where do you run? Do you run to things of pleasure? I have, a, I have another option for you. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10 says it this way, that the name of the Lord is a fortified tower. It's a strong tower, and the righteous run to it, and they are safe. Can I just, can I just let somebody know on a Wednesday night that running to pleasure is a storm creator, while running to the name of the Lord is a storm shelter. You're running to the wrong things and you're wondering why the chaos is getting worse. You run to things of pleasure and it creates another storm. You run to things of pleasure and you're going to see another tornado pop up just when you thought you had one burned out. But you run to the house of the Lord and the name of the Lord and you will find it to be a shelter from the storm. Have you ever been in a storm cellar? Pastor Johnson's parents in Oklahoma used to have a storm cellar. And I remember, Cassidy, when you and I were first married and we would, we would go to Oklahoma, I remember driving granddad's old truck. There were, it was a single cab Chevy, an old Chevy. And I was, we, had, we, weren't, we hadn't been together long. And I'm driving his truck in Oklahoma. And there's like four of us piled in the cab. Y'all, we got pulled over. I'm like, what is happening? But I remember, I, I, I loved looking at the storm cellar. We don't have that stuff in Texas. But you open the storm cellar, and you walk down. It's in, in ground. You walk in the ground, and, and there's, there's a little cot for sleeping. There's some water in there. There's some food. There's a radio. There's a flashlight. 
Isn't it amazing how in a, a storm shelter, you have everything you need to survive? In a storm shelter, it may not be exactly what you want and what you, how it's going to be later, but you know that if I can get in there, I'm going to have everything I need until this storm passes. Can I tell you, if you will run to the right place, if you will run to the name of the Lord, you will find it to be a strong tower. And in him, you have everything that you need. In him, you'll have everything you need to make it through. It's amazing how the thing that can sustain you is found in him. It's not found in things of pleasure. It's found in the fortified tower. If you're looking for safety, you got to run to the right place. Don't allow your adversary. By the way, it is a trick of the adversary, and it is the oldest trick in the book, and we fall for it time and time again. Don't allow him to convince you that because you're going through a storm, that God doesn't care about you and that God doesn't love you. The enemy will use any situation in life to try to get right here between your ears and say, well, why would God allow that to happen? Where are you going to run? See, when I run to him, I can't tell you exactly how it's going to happen, but I know it's going to happen. I don't, I don't have the, the formula of how it's all going to work out, but when I run to him, I know it's going to work out because he, he's the one that can speak to the storm, and it has to be quiet that they, they obey the sound of his voice. They know, they know his voice. So as we, we continue, we read verse 2. We found that Ahimelech was afraid when he met David. It seemed unusual to Ahimelech that a prominent man like David would be wandering around the villages of Judea by himself, and it, and it made him think something, something had to be wrong. A man of David's stature doesn't just kind of roll by himself. He's got a crew with him. This man, people singing songs about. I mean, they're making YouTube videos about David, and they're going viral. This man, is a, he's a hero, and heroes, they don't roll alone. What, 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 why are you here by yourself? What's going on? What, what, what are you doing? What are you doing, David? Why are you alone, and why is no one with you? And it appears as if the priest Ahimelech knew nothing about the conflict between David and Saul. Because it seems strange and dangerous to him that David would travel alone. So David answered in verse 2. He answers Ahimelech the priest. And this, watch his answer. The king sent me on a mission. David, David, David. The king sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission I'm sending you on. As for my men, I've told them to meet me at a certain place. Now, David ran to the right place, but when he got there, he did the wrong thing. He ran to the right place, but he flat out lies in this moment. When his back's against the wall, David can't tell the truth. David ran to the house of the Lord, but he lies to protect himself. And he elaborates on the lie when he puts words into the king's mouth. No one, no, the king says, no one is to know what mission I'm on. Isn't it amazing how he's trying to establish an environment of secrecy? By the way, people in your world are trying to tell you, shh, don't, 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 don't tell anybody about this. Generally, it's not a good thing. Isn't it amazing how sin grows in secrecy? Sin grows in, in darkness. And David would begin to wrap himself up in a web of lies in this chapter because he's, he, shh, you can't tell anybody about this. That's why it's so important 
when you're walking through seasons, it's, it's important why you have to have the right people in your life that you can go to, that you can say, listen, I've been doing this in secret, but I gotta get this out in the light because if this stays in the dark, it's gonna grow and it's gonna take me to a place that I don't have the strength to get out of. But he elaborates on the lie by putting words into the king's mouth. I think it's really as I got to reading this, here's what I thought, and this is so bad, and I need the Lord to forgive me. I almost thought, well, it's, you can kind of almost excuse the lie here. He's trying, he's trying to protect his life. I mean, wouldn't you do the same thing if your life is on the, uh, I don't know, but I don't. I don't think you can excuse the lie. I don't think it's wise to excuse his lie because as we'll see in the next chapter, we won't get into it this week, but but in the next chapter, the consequences of his lie, oh, is so sad. I know his back was against the wall, but it's amazing how your character and your integrity shows when your back's against the wall. What's on the inside will come out when your back is against the wall. And unfortunately, there was this piece of David that came out in this moment. So David is talking to the priest and he's come in trying to be secret and quiet and don't don't tell people why I'm here. And he's hungry from his journey and he's thirsty and he tells he tells the priest this. He says, now then, what do you have on hand? <laughs> you boy's hungry. Why, why don't you give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find? And Ahimelech goes on to tell him, listen, we don't have common bread in the house of the Lord, but I got holy bread. It's called the show bread. Can I, can I teach you for a second and just remind you again about the tabernacle? The tabernacle of the Lord had a table with 12 loaves of bread, symbolizing God's continual fellowship with Israel. And showbread literally means the bread of faces. This is powerful. Let me, let me teach you for a second. It's bread associated with and to be eaten before the face of God in the house of the Lord. So to eat the bread was to eat God's bread in God's house as a friend and a guest of the Lord, enjoying hospitality and relationship with the Lord. And in this culture, eating together formed a bond, friendship and this permanent, uh, sacred relationship. And so the bread was to always be fresh. And Ahimelech would give David the old bread, which had been taken from before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place. By the way, God wants our fellowship with him, our time before his face to always be fresh. If you're living on yesterday's relationship, can I tell you, it's time to replace the old bread with something fresh. It's time to find your prayer life again. It's it's time to find your daily devotion again, your quiet time with him. And this is where things kind of get a little bit interesting here. In reference, to, in reference to the bread, because Leviticus chapter 24, verse 9, in reference to the bread, it says this, it belongs to Aaron and his sons. What he's saying is it belongs to the priests who are to eat it in the sanctuary area. Now, the scripture doesn't, doesn't say specifically only priests, but it does establish a cultural norm, and it became a custom that only priests would eat the bread, the old bread that was in the house of the Lord. This was the custom and the tradition of the day, and this is what I want, this is what I want you to see tonight, that in David getting the bread, Ahimelech broke with priestly customs, but he didn't break with God's word. 
human traditions and human customs are never more important than God's word. You and I can never, come on, if you've been in church for a little while, let this, let this sink in for a second. We cannot elevate our tradition to the same level as God's word. And it's easy, but this is how we've always done it. But this is, this is the way. Is it the way or is it your way? I know, it's, I know it's the way we've always done it, but, but human tradition is not above God's word. It, that, that's your preference, and I respect your preference, and I hope you respect my preference, but if my preference, oh, it's just my preference. But God's word is forever settled in heaven. If God's word says it, then we ain't changing it. Can I tell you, every once in a while, I don't even, I, I just, just hit me right now, I don't even have it, but, you know, some things in, in church are, are much like this, this pulpit. Just pick it up and move it. What it matter if I preach from over here? What if I just preach from right here the rest of the night? But some of us have traditions and we have things that, that we have our, our own convictions that we see as a fixture in the house of God that we can't move it. And I need you to know that some of the traditions and preferences, I'm not talking specifically anything in particular, but sometimes as Christians we can get into a rut and think that my preference is the way that it has to be done. And I want you to know that my preference is nothing more than just a piece of furniture. It doesn't change the structure of the house. My preference can always move. The structure doesn't change. So Ahimelech breaks from cultural norms and priestly customs, but he doesn't break with God's word. And I love this. In Matthew chapter 12, when the disciples were criticized for breaking religious custom, Jesus actually points back to this story. And he honors Ahimelech for what he did. And he said, whoa, 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 whoa. Y'all are getting after my boys, but I need you to go back and remember the priest Ahimelech. Let me ask you, are your preferences, are your traditions, have they become on the same level as God's word? Just something to contemplate. And we begin to see now how erratic David's behavior is and how it's becoming and his, his web of lies that he's now weaving. He's lied to Ahim Ahimelech and now watch this, verse 7. Now one of Saul's servants, this is important, this won't come back into play today, but it will later. I told you, the king has eyes everywhere. Now one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doag the Edomite, Saul's chief shepherd. Don't forget his name, we'll bring it back up. In verse 8, David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was so urgent. You liar. And he continues to weave a web of lies, talking about being on the king's mission when he wanted nothing to do with the king's mission. The king's mission was to kill him. He is lying through his teeth and he flees for his life and he lies through his teeth to protect his life. Priest, this 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 is powerful. The priest replies, "The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah. Well, it's here. What? The sword of Goliath, who you killed in the valley of Elah." 
It's here, David. I mean, it's, it's here. Well, where, where is it? It's wrapped, it's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. You know what the ephod was, don't you? The ephod was a garment of worship. Can I just remind somebody on a Wednesday night that your victory is found on the other side of your worship. What you're looking for in battle to take on the enemy is always found on the other side of your worship. So you wonder why we spend 20 minutes worshiping the Lord before there's ever a word that is preached. It's because your victory is found on the other side of your worship. Our lives are not about us. Our lives are about him. We've got to learn how to worship him. And battles are won through your worship. He said it's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There's no sword here but that one. And David says this. David, David kind of, what? Perked up. He said there is none like it. Give it to me. So evidently, there was something special about this sword. There must have been something that, that just, ooh, David, he, I almost wonder when, when Ahimelech told him that the sword was hidden back here behind the ephod, I wonder if it brought back all the memories and the emotion when David was standing in the valley of Elah and he slayed Goliath the giant. I wonder if it just began to flood him all, all again. Give me that sword. There is none like it. Now watch. Here's, here's what I feel like we need to understand before I let us go tonight. David, you can have the sword of Goliath in your arsenal. But the sword will only work if it's paired with the same amount of faith that you had when you slayed Goliath. See, David, here's the problem. You've walked in here and you are scared to death for your life. You are terrified that you're gonna die and you've run and you're lying through your teeth to save your life and you think a sword is gonna do the trick. Can I tell you, the sword is powerful and there's none like it, but the only way the sword works is that if it's coupled with the faith in God that you had when you were just a boy. The weapon won't work on your own strength. The weapon will work when you've got faith behind it. And right now, David, you don't have faith. David, you've forgotten what God has done for you, and you've allowed the enemy to get in your mind and convince you that because the king's after you, he's going to take you out. David, you, you, you're welcome to have you're welcome to have the sword in your arsenal, but you better find that same faith that you had when you were a boy. If you want this weapon to work, there's gotta be a faith on the inside of you that knows that even though I'm walking through it right now and my life is on the line, that God has not left me here by myself. That if he delivered me from the hand of the lion and the hand of the bear and he delivered me from Goliath, you're going to do it one more time. You can have the sword, but you better have childlike faith too. Go ahead and believe again, David, that God can deliver you. I know it doesn't seem feasible right now. I know it seems unattainable, but can you believe again? Ladies and gentlemen, you can pick up a tried and true weapon you better pair it with childlike faith. You better have a faith in God. You can carry around a weapon all you want, but guess what? There's going to come a time when in your own strength, you're not going to have strength to swing the weapon anymore. Your arm's tired. And you're going to need the strength from heaven. Say, God, I know you're going to help me fight my battles right now. I'm not fighting this battle on my own. Your strength is going with me. 
The weapon is what it is because of the faith that you put behind it. David, I know you're on the run, but don't lose confidence in God. Don't lose confidence in who he's called you to be. Don't lose confidence. Remember when you were anointed, he didn't just anoint you to leave you here. He still has plans for you, David. He still has a purpose for you, David. Find your faith again. Find your faith again. I know it's hard. Pick it back up. Got to thinking, it's pretty interesting. David was so enamored by the sword. Would you stand with me? We gotta get you home. This crazy, think about this for a second. David was so enamored with Goliath, with his sword. It almost seems like he's now trusting in the sword of a Philistine more than the tools of a shepherd. There's nothing wrong with Goliath's sword, David. You gotta have the sword and faith. You gotta have faith, David story actually I'll finish the story it's not on the screen and it says this the day David fled from Saul this is verse 10 he went to Achish the king of Gath but the servants of Achish said to him is this David the king of the land isn't, isn't he the one that they sing about in their dances Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands David took these words to heart, watch, and he was very much afraid. Fear had gripped his, he was so scared for his life. So watch what he does, he loses his mind literally. He pretends to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the door of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. Kish said to the servants, look at the man. He is insane. Why bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you have to bring him to me? We don't have, we got enough madmen here. Get this man out of here. Must this man come to my house? Can I tell you? You know what fear will do to you? Fear will cause you to do things you would never do before. Fear will cause you to do some things that you never thought possible. Fear will allow you to act like a crazy person. That's why you gotta find your faith again. That's why you, you, you gotta pick your faith back up. You gotta remember again that even though you're in the middle of the season that you're in, that God hasn't brought you this far to leave you right here. If he's brought you this far, if he's called you, if he's anointed you, if he's appointed you, He's gonna see it through to the end. What an amazing service we just experienced together. And on behalf of our pastoral team, leadership team, and staff, we wanna thank you for tuning into Christian Life Austin online. We pray that this service remains in your heart and helps lead you to your next steps on your faith journey. We wanna take this moment to allow you the opportunity to give your life to Jesus if you've never made that choice before. Whether you're watching in your living room, kitchen, or on vacation, we know that Jesus will meet you right where you are. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. If you want salvation today, it's as simple but as powerful as confessing Jesus as Lord of your life and having faith that God raised Him from the dead. Let's take a moment to pray together. You can pray out loud, repeat after me, or use your own words. Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence today. We thank you for the word that changed our lives and our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would continue to transform us from the inside out. Today, we make the choice to believe that you died on a cross for us, was buried for three days, and rose from the dead. We put our faith in you, and we thank you for this opportunity for brand new life. Lord, today as we take on our new identity as a child of the Most High King, I pray that you would give us a new strength, a new boldness to walk in power and in light. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Wow, congratulations to all of you who made the decision to give your life to Jesus. All of heaven is celebrating you and we're celebrating with you. But hey, we know that this is only step one. We want you to know that you are not alone on this walk and we are not leaving you to figure it out by yourself. We wanna partner with you as we walk through our core values together. Know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference in the lives of others. We would love to help you take your next step. Whether it's water baptism, joining a life group, or getting plugged in serving through Growth Track, we have everything you need to make this process easy, accessible, and applicable to you and your life, no matter what stage of life you're in. You are somebody at Christian Life Austin, and you are somebody to the kingdom of heaven. We want to know what your next step is, and we want to hear from you if you gave your life to Jesus today. Please click the link in the description so we can get connected with you. Again, thank you for tuning in, and we can't wait to see you in person at Christian Life Austin.